There's a lot of things to be said about Dave Grohl. He's a punk rocker, an amazing singer, songwriter, drummer, and guitarist. He's created some of rock music's most appreciated albums, and he's always lived up to his own philosophy of creating better music than what he did yesterday. As a result, Dave has and is inspiring a new generation of rock musicians to take the stage, and it's definitely worth being grateful for that. But this wasn't something he achieved in a day. It was a rather long journey for him. So let's take a closer look. Dave Grohl was born David Eric Grohl on January 14th of 1969 in Warren, Ohio. His mother, Virginia Sean, was a teacher and his father, James Harbour Grohl, was a news writer. When Dave was still a child, his family moved to Springfield, Virginia, and shortly after, his parents divorced. He subsequently grew up with his mother, who early on encouraged him to play music when he was about 10 years old. Grohl wasn't the type of kid who liked school. He had troubles with authority, and he'd rather plan his own agenda from a very early age. When he was 12, he started playing the guitar through guitar lessons, but quickly grew tired of that and started learning by himself. I like that, you know, if I go to Ikea and buy a shitty fucking chair that I need to put together. I don't really want to look at the instructions. I kind of want to just figure it out. Because at the end of the day, when I'm sitting there in my shitty IKEA chair, I feel proud that IKEA didn't tell me how to put it together, you know. Now, from what I've discovered, Dave has a very unique way of thinking about the guitar as an instrument. He sometimes creates a riff from the perspective of a drum set, and I think that is something that separates him from other artists in his way of composing. The way I look at a guitar is like a drum set. I look at the lower strings like they're kicks and snares, and I look at these like they're cymbals. Really? So when I play... It's almost like a kick-snare pattern. When Dave was 13, music drastically started changing his life. One time, he and his sister spent the summer in Evanston, Illinois, with their cousin Tracy. She was the one who introduced them to punk rock, showed them her record collection, and took them to shows. They even went to see Naked Ray Gun, a punk band that played at the Cubby Bear in Chicago in 1982, and it was Dave's first concert experience, something that definitely made a profound impact on him. As he stated himself, quote, from then on, we were totally punk. We went home and brought Maximum Rock and Roll and tried to figure it all out. He also recalls Edgar Winter's Frankenstein as a song that ringed in his head for many, many years to come. Now, in Virginia, Dave attended Thomas Jefferson High School as a freshman. Since he was elected to be the vice president of the class, his duty was to do morning announcements, and he would sometimes play music snippets of punk music on the intercom before he made the announcements. He recalls himself playing a lot of circle jerks and bad brains, amongst other bands. It was during high school that Dave really started exploring the musical territories of his hometown. He played in a series of local bands, most notably Freak Baby, which later renamed themselves to Mission Impossible, and another band called Dane Bramage. It was around this time that he decided to learn to play the drums after being inspired by John Bonham and different figures in the punk culture. When, when I was young and I'd listen to Beatles records or Led Zeppelin records or Rolling Stones records, those musicians were just so, like, they were so technically proficient that there was no, I thought, well, there's no way that I could ever be in a band because I can't play guitar like Jimmy Page or I can't play guitar like, you know, Keith Richards. And then once I discovered this punk rock music, I realized like, wow, you just need, you just need three chords and like a big heart, you know? You just need to express yourself in this most simple form, you know? 
When Dave was still in his junior year of high school, he auditioned as a new drummer for the local high-profile band Scream. He got the job and soon decided to drop out of high school to travel and tour with the band. Dave toured extensively with Scream over the next years. They released a few albums and also became a fan of Melvin's. But he wasn't just a fan of this band, he eventually became friends with the band members after meeting them while touring. One time when the Melvins were touring the west coast around the same area as Scream played, guitarist and vocalist Buzz Osborne brought a couple of friends to see them play live. <laughs> this was Kurt Cobain and Chris Novoselic. And you probably get where the story goes, right? To keep it short, Scream disbanded, Grohl asked his friend Buzz for help, and Buzz knew that Nirvana needed a new drummer, so he became their new drummer. At this point, the band had worked with Butch Vig on recording demos that would eventually become their second full-length album, Nevermind. In the beginning, a lot of their time together was spent driving back and forth from label to label, looking for the best deal they could get. They eventually signed with DGC Records and did studio sessions in early 1991. When Nevermind was released, it exceeded all expectations and became a worldwide hit. But Despite of their successes, Dave wasn't eager to share his gift for songwriting with the band. He felt like Kurt was a way better songwriter than him, so in order to not screw up the band's creative formula, so to speak, he went on to record material on his own. And this resulted in a cassette tape that he released in 1992 called Pocket Watch under the moniker Late. And, you know, I didn't want to, like try to edge in on the songwriting in Nirvana because our songwriter was pretty kick-ass. And that's the famous joke, like, what's the last thing the drummer said before he got kicked out of the band? Hey guys, I got a song we should play, you know? So I didn't, I didn't fucking... But Kurt was fond of Dave's songwriting though, both in terms of lyrics and melody. So as time went by, the band decided to collaborate in a more member-inclusive way. An example of this is Marigold, a song that was featured as a B-side on the Heart Shaped Box single. Dave actually sang, provided lyrics and melody for the entire song. Following Cobain's death in April of 94, Dave didn't know what to do with himself. He was emotionally drained and decided to take a break from music for some time. But then after the summer of 94, he quickly booked some time in the studio to record a cassette. He did the session almost entirely by himself, recording everything from vocals, guitars, bass and drums. The result was named Foo Fighters, something that later became a band that he would stay involved with up until this day. Now, the rebooting of his career brought on several opportunities for him. Later in 94, he filled in as the drummer for Tom Petty during his performance on Saturday Night Live. Tom even asked Dave if he wanted to be the band's permanent drummer, but he kindly declined with the ambition of fronting a band for himself. Once the Foo Fighters tape generated some buzz, he signed with a record label and gathered Pat Smear from The Germs as rhythm guitarist and Nate Mendel and William Goldsmith from Sunny Day Real Estate on bass and drums. But this was not the consistent lineup of the band. Although their sound has been somewhat consistent over the years, they've juggled members and always tried to make each album better than the previous one. Sometimes this ended up in the band taking on different projects, such as creating their own studio, recording in Dave's garage using only analog equipment, and even recording in many different studios all over the US. Now, if you think that Foo Fighters was the only project that Dave Rule had in mind at this point, you're very, very wrong. In the early 2000s, for example, he spent some time in his basement studio and recorded a metal album under the moniker ProBot. This was a collaborative project where Dave invited some of his 
favorite artists like Lemmy from Motorhead, Conrad Kronos Lant from Venom, King Diamond, Scott Weinrich, Snake from Voivod, and Max Cavalera from Sepultura. Shortly said, he has collaborated with a ton of artists over the years. And on the rest of the name list, we find Tommy Iommi, Tenacious D, Chan Marshall, Queens of the Stone Age, Nine Inch Nails, Garbage, Neil Young, Paul McCartney, The Prodigy, Slash, Cage the Elephant, and the list just goes on and on. But just because they've collaborated with all of these artists and had a successful run with Foo Fighters and Nirvana, he still went on to create yet another band. In 2009, he created Them Crooked Vultures with singer and guitarist Josh Homme from Queens of the Stone Age and bassist John Paul Jones from Led Zeppelin, of course. Dave provided backing vocals and drums, while they also recruited previous Queens of the Stone Age member Elaine Johannes, who contributed guitar, bass, keyboards, and backing vocals on their 2009 and 10 tour. As you can probably tell by now, Dave has an incredible work ethic. He's always working on something. And you know, people ask me, he goes, you ever jealous of Dave and everything he's done since Nirvana? And I'm like, listen, man, he has stayed focused, he has worked hard, he rocks, the Foo Fighters rock. How do you be jealous of something like that? He's earned everything he's worked for. We have to. So you do three nights in a row where you play for what, two and a half hours, right? Sometimes three? Mm -hmm. It doesn't fuck with your voice? No, right? by the last show I sound like <laughs> Lemmy or Jazz from Killing Joke, but who cares? <laughs> You know, give the people what they want. Look, I want to see your hands. I mean, it gets from the last tour, thinking, okay, what do we do now? Every album that we'd made, I'd always imagined to be our last. I really always imagined this one's going to be our last record. We better make it good. Dave is very good at attacking different projects with the same mentality and philosophy. And while having such a strong work ethic, he's also just an incredibly chill dude. Now, there's more things to be said about this guy. He is not just a great musician and band leader and frontman. Every time he plays a concert, he's just an amazing host. You feel incredibly welcome at his shows. And James Hetfield from Metallica is one of those guys who inspired him to take that role as an amazing host. He also states David Bowie as one of the guys that inspired him to be more relaxed on stage. Even when he's in pain, he's still able to keep the show going. I think I just broke my leg. No! I think I really broke my leg. And believe me, this is not the first time Dave went to the hospital because of some unexpected shit. Earlier on, while recording and playing with them crooked vultures, he had this very unhealthy coffee drinking habit. Do you hear that drum roll? <laughs> no. <laughs> Celebrate me! <laughs> To sum this up, I want to say that Dave Grohl is a punk rocker, an amazing singer, songwriter, drummer, and guitarist. He's created some of rock music's most appreciated albums, and has always wanted to create better music than what he did yesterday. To sum this video up, I think Dave has, and still is, inspiring a new generation of rock musicians to take the stage, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. At the end of this video, I just want to say thank you so much for watching. And I also want to bring an extra thanks to Amadio, F Fun, Kyle, Marek, Marlene, Marshall, Middle Eight, Mike, and Nick over at Patreon for supporting me over there. And if you want to support me as well and make this channel even better, make sure you click the link in the description below. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.